We have been talking in the last few videos about the law of God and sin, how it came into existence and things of that nature, at least when it came to existence here on this earth. But where did sin originally come from? Who started it? Will it ever end? These questions we're going to answer on this particular video. Whenever we have a question concerning eternal things, the first place that we should look to is the Word of God. Not to a mere man, but we need to take a look at the Word of God. Because as you recall, we were reading in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we need to study the word of God, but we must also rightly divide the word of God. Now why should we search the scriptures or study the word of God for our answers? Again, 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So the scriptures are the only ones that are able to tell us what is correct as far as belief is concerned. So in this question of where did sin originate, let us begin with the most logical question. Does sin originate with God? Did sin begin with God or did it begin somewhere else? We read before that Jesus created all things. Did Jesus create sin? Let us take a look. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 7. In that prayer of that faithful prophet of God, Daniel chapter 9, and let us look at verse 7. It says, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces. What belongs to God? To God it only belongs is righteousness. And because only righteousness belongs to God, the only thing that He could command is righteousness. Let's look at Psalm 119, verse 172. Psalm 119, verse 172. It says, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. All the commandments of God are righteousness. Whatever God does is righteousness. For that reason, sin cannot originate with God. With God, only righteousness comes to Him. So now, when we deal with righteousness or His commandments, we are talking about His character. The character of God is only righteousness. Now we can never come to the full, complete understanding of the character of God. Let's look at Romans chapter 11, verse 33 to 36. Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been His counselor? Or who hath first given unto Him? And it shall be recompensed unto Him again. For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. So when we look at the character of God, God's character is nothing else but righteousness. And we will never fully understand the character of God, the full righteousness of the character. But there are some things that are revealed to us. We read not long ago in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law so the reason that God reveals certain parts of His character is so that we may be obedient to the Word of God in that character. 2 Timothy 3 verse 17 tells us what God's ideal is for us. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, unto all good works. So God's desire is that we achieve perfection. So again, why is it so important to know God? Why do we need to know God? Why is it important for us to search a little bit into what God has revealed about Himself? 
Well, we find this in John 14, John 14 and verse 6. Remember, Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It is only through Jesus Christ. It is th only through knowing God that we can come to the Father. And in that prayer of Jesus, the last prayer for His disciples, in John 17, verse 3, He tells us why it is so important for us to know God. It says there, And this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. What is eternal life? Eternal life is knowing God. If you want eternal life, you must know God. Well, it doesn't say knowing Him unto perfection, because we cannot know Him unto perfection. But we need to know Him to all the things that He has revealed. Those things which has re He has revealed for us and for our children. Now, when do we have eternal life? When knowing God means that we have eternal life, when do we possess eternal life? In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, 1 John chapter 5 verse 13 tells us when we actually possess eternal life. It says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. That you may know that you have eternal life. When? When we accept Jesus. In verse 12 it says, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. If you want that eternal life, we must know God. And the only way we can know God is through Jesus and through the Word of God that is revealed to us here in this world. Since God is righteous and only righteous, where does sin come from if it does not originate from Him? When will this terrible curse end? Did it begin here in this earth? Let us always remember that it is impossible to explain sin as to give a reason for its existence. You see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7, it describes sin. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7 says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. So here it mentions, it calls it the mystery of iniquity. Sin is a mystery. We, do not, we cannot give the reason for its existence. The Bible tells us where it existed, but the reason for it is unknown. It should never have happened. Sin is an intruder for whose presence no reason can be given. It is myst mysterious, unaccountable. To excuse it is to defend it. Whenever someone excuses a sin, they're actually defending that sin. Could excuse be found or cause be shown for its existence, it would cease to be sin. So where did sin originate? Again, before we go into sin itself, let us remind ourselves from the last few studies on what sin is. What is sin? 1 John 3 verse 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So sin is transgression of the law of God. Since the law of God is a revelation of His character, then sin is a Note of discord. Sin is rebellion against the character of God. Jesus prayed for His disciples in John 17, verse 21, that they all may be one, as Thou, Father, art in Me, and I in Thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that Thou hast sent Me. You see, in John 17, Jesus prayed for a oneness to exist among His people. He wanted their oneness to exist that they had right from the very beginning. At the same time that Jesus prayed for oneness, unfortunately there's also division. In Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 36, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. 
So here it says that Jesus, although he was praying on one hand for oneness, that oneness that they always had, he also says he came not to bring oneness, he came to bring a sword. And why did he come to bring a sword? You see, Christ declared, I came not to send peace but a sword. Why? Because men would not receive the word of life. Because they warred against the message sent them to bring them joy and hope and life. We look upon the Jews many times as if they're inexcusable because they rejected and crucified Jesus Christ. But today, the messages that the Lord sends are often received in a manner similar to the way in which the Jews received the message of Christ. If the instruction of the Lord does not harmonize with the opinions of men, anger takes control of reason and may men play into the enemy's hands by opposing the message that God sends. Satan uses them as sharp instruments to oppose the progress of the truth. And then what you have is war, you have a sword. Now although there is unity among Christ's followers, Satan brings only discord. Even among his own followers there is discord. Their disagreement with among themselves. They argue with each other unless they want to get rid of the message of Jesus. For example, the Pharisees and Sadducees. The Pharisees and Sadducees were always fighting with each other. But when it came time to kill Jesus, they suddenly had unity. It is amazing how that happens. So we may conclude then that before sin existed, there was perfect unity in the universe. All created beings were in harmony with the character of God. All was held together by the power of love. In 1 John 4, verse 16, it says, God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. So the foundation of God's eternal kingdom has always been based upon the foundation of love. Even why do we love Jesus? According to 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. We read before in Revelation 13, 8, that Jesus was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. His love was there for us even before we sinned. He expressed His love. He gave Himself as a sacrifice for us. So where then in midst of all of this love, all of this harmony, all of this unity, amidst all of that, how did sin get into this all and destroy the peace and unity that existed in the very beginning? Well, let's take a look in Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel 28, and let us read verses 11 through 15. It says, Moreover the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now here it mentions the king of Tyrus. But this really was not the king of Tyrus. He was only using the king of Tyrus as a symbol of someone else. And why is that? Let's take a look. Verse 13, it says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Where was he? Thou wast in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that coverest, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Notice some important points in this passage. The king of Tyrus was a human being. He was born of women. Therefore, what was he from birth? Romans 3.23, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Who had sinned? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when did we begin our sinning process? Psalm chapter 51, Psalm 51. When did we begin to sin? Psalm 51 and verse 5. It says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. There is only one, one record of anyone that was born of women that did not sin. 
We read that in 1 Peter chapter 2, 21 and 22. 1 Peter 2, 21 and 22. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Jesus is the only one that was born of women that did not sin. So now when it says here about the king of Tyre's, it says here, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So it's speaking here about someone that was perfect from the day of creation until sin was found in them. And it also says that they were in the Garden of Eden. Now, in the Garden of Eden, who was there? Who was in the Garden of Eden? Let's look at Genesis 3, verse 22 to 24. Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 to 24. It says, And the Lord God said, Behold, a man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand, and take also the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth out from the garden of Eden, to till the ground from whence he was taken. It says here that God sent Adam and Eve, our first parents, outside of the garden of Eden. They were the only ones, and they sinned, and they were expelled from the garden. Only them too. The only other being involved with sin in Eden was the serpent. You recall in chapter 3 it says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So it's mentioning here that there was the serpent. Now, who is the serpent? Who is the serpent in which there was sin? In reality, the serpent we find in Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So here we find that the only beings that are recorded that were there in the Garden of Eden, you had Adam and Eve, and then you had this serpent, and this serpent is Satan. And this serpent being Satan was the one that was in the Garden of Eden. So when we, re we are reading here about the king of Tyrus, we're actually reading about Satan and the origin of him. Notice the description of Satan before he came to what we've known him today. Ezekiel 28 and verse 14 says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. This Satan, before he became in this world, he was the anointed cherub. He was a cherub in the kingdom of God. What a very lofty position. What a high position. In Exodus 25, Verse 18, we'll start at verse 18. And thou shalt make two cherubim of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shalt ye make the cherubim on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall be stretched forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another towards the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubim be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So these cherubim, where they were placed, God was going to meet together right there with the people. God was right there in between those cherubim. So when it says in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 28, when it talks there about this king of Tyre, about Satan, it says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth.
In other words, Satan was right there into the close presence of God. Rebellion in the universe did not take place from some remote area away from God. Rebellion began right there in the heart of the covering cherub. We also realize that he was a very musical being. Notice verse 13. Ezekiel 28, verse 13. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So this shows that there was some musical capability in the day he was created. This is why Satan uses music so much to destroy people today, because he was a real professional musician. It goes on, verses 16 through 19, tells us the reasons why he rebelled. It doesn't excuse it. It doesn't say the, it doesn't give how it came about. It just records the experience, the historical reasons. But it doesn't go back into the motive. How could it exist? We don't know. But this is what he did. Let's look at verses 16 through 19. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. He was right there in the midst of the stones of fire. He was right there in the presence of God. Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. He was obviously a very beautiful creature that God had created. And because he was so beautiful, he suddenly began to be lifted up as a result. And also he was corrupted because of his wisdom. God had given him plenty of wisdom, but he got corrupted as a result of that wisdom. What a tragedy. God gave him something wonderful and instead of glorifying God with it, he ended up being destroyed with it. Verse 18, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among thy people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. What is going to happen to Satan? It says, I will bring thee to ashes. What is God going to do? He's going to take this created being and he's going to bring him to ashes. And then, is Satan going to exist throughout all eternity? Is Satan somewhere in charge of hell that he's going to exist there forever and ever? Notice here verse 19. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror and never shalt thou be any more. In Malachi it also describes this experience. Malachi chapter 4 verses 1 to 3. It describes the destruction of sin. Malachi 4 verses 1 to 3. It says, For behold, a day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. What's going to happen? He's going to burn it all up, not even the root. And who is the root? Right there was the origin. That root nor branch will be left. It will all be destroyed. Verse 3, And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. What's going to happen? They shall be ashes under the feet. Another description of all of this is found in Revelation 20 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever. What's going to happen? They're going to be thrown into the place that is called the lake of fire. Now another chapter also talks a little bit about Lucifer. 
about Satan. There it calls him Lucifer. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 20. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 20. Here it gives a description again of this being. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which does weaken the nation? Here it calls him Lucifer. And what did he do? It says he fell down from heaven. Before we read these other verses, let's read the description of that fall from heaven. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Revelation 12, verses 7 through 9. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast into this earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So how did Satan come into this world? Well, he was cast out of heaven. He was put out of heaven. And this is why they began to rejoice in heaven. It says in verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Verse 11 and 12, And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So he's coming in greater wrath because he was put down out of heaven. And so in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12 it says also, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? It is that same being. And it goes on and tells us why he fell. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake the kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nations, even of them, lie in glory, everyone in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as a raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword, they go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. What a description of the origin of sin. He wanted to be like the Most High. In other words, pride somehow mysteriously entered into his mind and he cherished it until it became rebellion. For this reason, we can appreciate a little bit the warning that God has about pride. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before the fall. Yes, this is what happened to Lucifer. Also, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. This original of sins is still the cause of woe, not only with Satan and his angels, but to all those who are not living in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Therefore, what did Satan become? Satan... This Lucifer actually became Satan. God created Lucifer. The name means son of the morning. God created him. And instead, he became Satan. He, instead of seeking to glorify God like he was supposed to be, he began to try to get the affections and allegiance from God to himself. You see, when God creates, he created everyone for a reason. Let us look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16.
for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be throngs or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. We were created for God and he has the right to the affections for which he has created us. As a result of bringing sin upon himself, we find that he has become the father of all evil. John chapter 8 verse 44, John chapter 8 verse 44, John 8 44, Jesus said, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. That's right. So he is the origin of all lies. He is the father of lies. He is the father. He is the originator of sin. It originated with him, not with God. God created the sun of the morning. God created the morning star. God created Lucifer. God did not create Satan. What did Satan do as a result? It says he is a murderer. And whom did he murder? And what was the result? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. You see, the devil went there. He came there to destroy Jesus. He put him on the cross and he did not realize that in hanging Jesus on the cross, that was his death knell. That was it. Satan's doom was fixed. That because through death, Jesus was going to destroy him that had power over death. That is the devil. But you know something? You know what makes people bold? Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11. What makes people bold to continue in the process of sin? Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 11 says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the Son of Men is fully set in them to do evil. You see, because Satan was not destroyed immediately. He keeps getting bolder and bolder. But God had to allow this Satan to develop his plans. He had to permit him to do that because if he did not, it would always leave a doubt in the universe. So today, what is he doing? We read before in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, He is going around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He wants to destroy us. He wants to do everything he can to destroy God's plan for his people. God is working on a very long plan. The plan of salvation is not only a plan to be able to redeem human beings, but there's something else. In the book Nahum, Nahum chapter 1 and verse 9. What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. No, God is working in such a way that affliction will never come again. That sin, once it is eradicated, that it will never come again to defile the universe. That through all eternal ages, year after year, millennium after millennium, millions of years upon millions of years, throughout all eternity, sin will never bother the universe. An inspired writer wrote, a picture of that end of the controversy in this way. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From Him who created all flow life and light and gladness. Throughout the realms of illimitable space, from the minutest, minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love. Isn't that wonderful? 
just remember the words of 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 through 14. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 through 14. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to the, His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. What is going to be there? God is going to make a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to destroy anything that has to do with sin. And there's going to be a new place where there's only peace and harmony. Do you want to be there? Do you want to be associated with the father of lies? Or do you want to be associated with the king of the universe? You know that day can actually be hastened. We can actually speed up the coming of Jesus when all these things can come to an end. In verse 14 it says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of Him in peace without spot and blameless. We have the opportunity to be like Jesus. Right now is our choice. You can follow the originator of lies, the one who started this whole problem with sin, or you can follow Jesus. You can follow the plan of redemption, which He developed a plan to eradicate evil, that there's no more going to be discord, disharmony, murders, lies. Do you like the way the world is going on today? I sure don't. The, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end of all, we're only going to end up in death. Satan is going to end up in ashes. If you follow with Satan, you also will end up with ashes. You know, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Isaiah describes that new heaven and a new earth as a place that we will plant vineyards and in and eat the fruit thereof. We shall build houses and inhabit them. Do you want to go in a place like that? You know, every one of us are going to be there. Every one of us are going to be in that earth made new. Every one of us. That's right. Even the wicked will be there. But you remember what we read in Malachi. What are they going to be there? They are going to be the ashes under the soles of the saints' feet. Now you have a choice. You have a choice to plant the vineyard and eat the fruit of them, or you can be the ashes and fertilize those vineyards. You know, I personally would like to eat the fruit, and I hope that you also will desire to eat the fruit. Right now, take this opportunity to give your heart to Jesus, the only one that can rescue you from the snare of Satan, so you can come up and enjoy the fruit of that land.